in fact, when I took my wife to to the clinic, uh, we were listening to some Christmas music. You know, we're we're driving uh, the Edwards vehicle right now because uh, we're helping them carry the boys back and forth, and uh, so it's got the car seats there. And so they have uh, satellite radio. So I looked up a, a Christmas station and and heard some music by Nat King Nat King Cole and. Uh, Dean Martin and uh, Frank Sinatra, you know, all the oldies, you know, so it was nice. Ella Fitzgerald, some good old fashioned Christmas music. And I, I love that. I mean, who doesn't love Christmas carols, right? I mean, and the thing is that we sing Christmas carols in such a shortened time period. I mean, it's not really that long of a period, a few weeks, some of you longer, a few months maybe, but uh, Nonetheless, they bring joy to us, don't they? they? In fact, after we heard a few songs, I told my wife, okay, I'm in the Christmas spirit now. That, that really helped me. And, uh, so, but not only do we enjoy listening to them and singing them, but there is some rich theology in, in many carols. Uh, I'm not talking about, you know, Grandma got run over by a reindeer. I'm talking about the real Christmas carols, right? There are some rich theology behind them that we want to we wanna look into. And so today we start this new sermon series named Carols. Now, nine years ago, we did a series with the same title, Carols. And we did the same thing. We, we looked at the message behind some of the songs that we sing at Christmas. And so this is not going to be a complete repeat. I might, I might uh, maybe address one or, or two at the most songs that we did uh, nine years ago. And uh, it, nevertheless, it'll be the revised, updated version, right? So, but uh, some new songs as well. Uh, and so today we're going to look at the song, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Hark the Herald Angels Sing. This is one of my favorite carols, and I, I like it. I love the melody of it, but I, I really like it because of the theology behind this song. Now, this song was written by a man named Charles Wesley. You may know that Charles Wesley was a brother of the famous John Wesley. You know, the Wesley brothers were great revivalists in, in England. They weren't accepted by the Church of England or by the Anglican Church. Rather, they, they weren't admitted into that church because they weren't happy with the way this, that these two men, these two brothers, Wesley brothers, the way they ministered. Uh, the way they ministered is that they preached outside. They preached to, to people who would gather in crowds uh, and, you know, the Anglican church thought, well, that's not church. Church, you've got to be in this big building and you've got to have all the, you know, you, you, church in a ca school cafeteria. That's not really church. Church outside. That, so they didn't accept them because of that. It, it wasn't their message. It was their method. And, uh, but nevertheless, God used them. If you know the history, God used them in, in great ways. And so uh, Charles Wesley wrote uh, the lyrics to this song. But this song, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, always raises this question for me. Did the angels really sing? Does the Bible say that the angels sang? Well, actually, the Bible doesn't specifically say they sang. What we're going to read here in just a minute is that, is that the, the shepherds heard them praising God and saying. Uh, so it doesn't say they sang. I looked up that word saying. Uh, in the Greek, and it just means saying. I mean, there's no, it just means to tell something, right? To make something known. Uh, but nevertheless, I, I think that there, uh, there had to have been, because there were all the angels saying this, there had to have been some kind of organized speaking or chanting, I don't know, which it could have been singing. But uh, I think the point is that the message of the angels was so extraordinarily important and, and that's why this song is a very important part of our Christmas celebration. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to stand and we're going to sing this song together. Okay, so let's go. Did you catch all that theology in those verses? I mean, every verse is just filled with theological truths. It's uh, just straight out of of God's Word, and uh, so it's an amazing song, and uh, I want to just uh, kind of go through um, parts of this song, uh, but first I want to read the portion of Scripture that this song is based on, the, the part about the angels, 
And so Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse 8, is where we find our text today. Luke 2, beginning with verse 8. I think this is a song they sing in the Charlie Brown special, isn't it? At the end, yeah, yeah, I love it, love it. All right, so here we go. Luke 2, verse 8, reads like this. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom His favor rests. Now the word hark, the song begins with hark, the herald angels sing. The word hark is, is an old word. We don't use that. Uh, we use listen to me. Pay attention, right? It just means to listen. It means to, to pay attention. And so the writer of this carol, of this song, is telling us to pay attention to something that is so important that he's afraid that they're going to miss. So it's like, I need your attention, please. Everybody listen up. And, you know, when I was... Uh, when I was teaching choir still, that was my full-time job, uh, we'd go out and perform maybe for UIL contests, or we'd go during Christmas season, we'd go out and perform a lot. And so sometimes I would, uh, I would need to give them some instructions, and I'd tell them, okay, we're out in public somewhere. And I'd say, okay, gather around. And they'd kind of gather around. i said, no, get really close. So they'd all get really close. And, because I wanted them to make sure they didn't miss my instructions, right, and they didn't miss the bus. And I have a friend who used to be a teacher at Lee Middle School many years ago who left behind two students in Abilene and came home without them. So that was always one of my greatest fears. You know, it's like, pay attention. You know, I'm, uh, I need to tell you something. So that's all that that means. Hark, listen. I don't want you to miss this. This is super important. This is very important. Now, the, the writer puts this message in the mouth of a shepherd. Now, shepherds were the only ones, we read in the scriptures, that actually saw the angels. Nobody else saw the angels. And so there are some things about what they saw. And can you imagine, if you see an angel, you got a story to tell. So there's some things about what they saw and what they heard that they needed to, to tell others. And it was so important, they said, listen, hark, listen to what I have to say. And so this Shepherd, you know, I said the writer put the song, the words of the song in the mouth of a shepherd. And this shepherd, it seems pretty overwhelmed. And I think we would have been too by what he saw, by what he heard. Specifically, a couple of things I want to I want to bring up and I want to draw out tonight or today, rather things that I think help us to understand uh, what the true meaning of Christmas is. So a couple of things. First of all, this shepherd was amazed that the angels chose to appear to him, specifically one angel and then the others who, who came and they began to praise God together. But he, he had to have been amazed the way he's telling this story in the song. He was amazed that the, this angel and, and the other angels chose to appear to him because if you know anything about shepherds and Bible times, shepherds had to be the least likely people on earth to receive any announcement of any importance. Uh, much more so to receive the announcement from the angels about the birth of a king. They were way down the ladder, the bottom of the ladder. I mean, it's surprising that the angels came to them and didn't go to the religious leaders. They didn't go to, to, to more important people in the community, uh, to the civil or civic leaders, but they went to the shepherds who were really, the, they occupied the lowest class in Jewish society. They occupied the lowest class in Jewish society. They were the ultimate unskilled laborers. Shepherding was something you gave to kids, not to men. So if you were an adult and you're still a shepherd, I mean, that was considered a pretty big life fail. That 
They're still shepherding. They can't do anything else. Total life fail. They were so low at, at, at the bottom of the rung of, the, of Jewish society that their testimony was not ever even uh, allowed in court. It wasn't accepted in court as, as truthful. You know, who saw this? Well, that shepherd. Oh, no, forget it. <laughs> Must not be true. They wouldn't accept that. And then shepherds just smelled bad. They, they didn't. They didn't uh, bathe, I, I read this week, but maybe every month and a half or two months, they would go in for a bath. And so people knew when they were close to a shepherd. But when I was reading about the shepherds and, and how, you know, they just, they did that as an unskilled job, uh, laborers. Um, and that, that whole idea of just going out, taking care of the sheep reminded me of a, of a young lady I met about four years ago. I was working, I worked for about four or five years at Lakeview High School as a, as a tutor to uh, English language learners, the ELL, they should be called ESL students. And um, so I got to meet a lot of great kids, mostly from Mexico, there were a few from Central America, but I met this young lady who came to, to the States, came to San Angelo, she was about uh, 15 or 16, I believe. She had, uh, had very inferior education, she told me, she went up to school, uh, approximately, I, I think she said it was the eighth grade, but she said, but it was a bad education. Our teachers didn't care about us. They were just there on their cell phones, which is, I found really interesting. Nobody else had cell phones, but the teachers did. She said, they were just on their cell phones. Uh, she laughed at me when I said, did you have music class? She's like, no, of course not. They had PE, and PE was going out and just picking up rocks, you know, and I don't know what they did with them. And so she finished that year, and when she came here, she was very behind with basic math, and you know, just and, and of course, then she had to learn the language. But she told me that uh, she didn't go to school for over a year before she came to San Angelo. And I asked her, "What did you do during that time? Were you just at home?" No, she said, "I took care of the goats. I just go out all day, take care of the goats, and then bring them in." And I don't know that she was out all day, but she'd be out for a long time, and then. So for over a year, she had no education, just taking care of goats. You know, no, really no future. And I guess that's, you know, it was a good step for them and the family to come uh, to San Angelo. And they struggled for a while. In fact, my wife and I bought them a heater when we found out that they didn't have any heat in their house. Uh, with the permission of the administrators at the school, I, I contacted uh, the mom and we dropped off uh, a heater. And when I walked, it was a cold day. When I walked into their house, uh, this young girl's mom met me with a hoodie over her head, and she was just bundled up. And in the living room, there's a bed, you know, a queen-size bed, I think, or a double bed. And they're in the living room. And another tutor that was working, we were working together, bought her a, another heater. And we, you know, tried to do something for them. Great kid. And I think she graduated. She was on, you know, pace to graduate the year of COVID. And uh, she was struggling with English, but, you know, I, I think she, she made it. But that's what I thought of, you know, there was no future for the shepherds. And so this is why the angels appearing to shepherds is so interesting. And I think it's so important because of this point. While Christmas is filled with joy for many people. You no, know, all the all is calm. All is bright. Joy to the world. Christmas, though, reminds other people of how disappointed they are with their lives. Christmas is a reminder that, you know, things aren't calm and bright in my life. There's no joy in my life. Christmas makes some people feel like they're all alone in life. Everybody goes home to their friends and to their families, and maybe you don't have anybody to go to. You're, you feel alone. Or maybe Christmas reminds you of someone who used to be in your life that was very important that is no longer there. A family member, a parent, a husband, a child, whomever, a boyfriend or girlfriend, and it's painful. Or maybe you forget how broken your family is until you get together, then you realize, oh, I love a close knit family that lives miles away, you know, because that's just, maybe that's just the way the situation is right now. Uh, for, for some people, their goal over the next few days is, you know, for the police not to get called to their to their home. It's that tough. It's that hard. Or maybe this Christmas finds you without a job and without any possibilities and you're worried about the future. Maybe you're concerned about your children. You're concerned about your marriage or maybe you're concerned about a lack of marriage prospects. I mean, any number of things 
that are heightened during this time when everybody's celebrating and we're singing and we're, we're going to celebrations. So these shepherds came into that very first Christmas, as it were, feeling as if their lives were empty. They were meaningless. Look at me. I'm, a, I'm an adult. I'm out here taking care of sheep. And maybe some of you are in the same place. And you are the ones to whom the angels most want to give their message. It's to those of you that are hurting. In fact, it's to all of us. Did you catch the message of the angels when they said, Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. That was their message, to you. And, and they're confirming what the prophet Isaiah had prophesied hundreds of years earlier when he said, Unto us. A son is born unto us. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. He was born for us. And I say this from time to time. I don't say it too much because I think people will misunderstand. But I say, uh, you know, we, it's important for some people. And I think it's a good thing to remind ourselves that Christmas is about Jesus. And we say Jesus is the reason for the season. And I believe that. But I also believe that we're the reason for the season. And I don't say that in a, in a selfish way, but I say it because the, uh, Isaiah said, unto us, a child is born unto us, for us. Some uh, Bible translations say, for us, a, a child is born for us, a son is given. The angel said, in the city of David today, a child has been born for you. And so it's a message that needs to be heard, uh, and it's for all of us, but I think especially for those that are hurting, those that are in pain over their current life situation. There's an important message here. Hark is what the song says. Hark, listen, this message is for you. Now, secondly, I believe this shepherd must have been amazed at the enormous celebration over the birth of a baby. Now, I know that the birth of a baby, we just had one in our family, a birth in our family uh, three weeks ago. She's precious. She's beautiful. I'm a little biased, I know, but, you know, we've we got lots of pictures of her. She was the center of our Thanksgiving celebration. Um, so we know that's exciting, but there were no angels that appeared to me or any of us when Miss Isabel was born. Uh, we thought there should have been, right? <laughs> but there were no angels. But with this baby being born, when Jesus was born, there were angels that appeared and they, the angels said, glory to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest. What that means is that God deserves the greatest praise. Now think about this. Of all the praise that God has received and is receiving and will receive, He deserves the greatest praise for the birth of this baby. The greatest praise. That's what the angels are, are, are saying. Now, what's amazing about this is that these angels had seen a lot. It's pretty remarkable that they're giving the greatest praise to God for the birth of Jesus when you think of everything else that the angels had seen. For example, they, they would have been firsthand uh, witnesses of creation where God said, let there be light, and immediately millions of galaxies appeared. Ours is not the only galaxy. There are millions of galaxies. Can you imagine how exciting and how awesome it must have been to see that? Let there be light, and boom, the galaxies appear. We get excited over fireworks. <laughs> on uh, uh, New Year's and on July the 4th, right? And that doesn't come close to comparing to, to what the angels saw. We get so excited over fireworks that we take out our cell phones. Have you ever done this? Take out your cell phones, take a picture or a video of the fireworks? Nobody's going to see those. All right, who are you going to gonna show them to? Put them on Facebook and everybody says, yeah, I have some like those. I was there too, you know. And it's not the same, right? It's not the same. So you end up eventually deleting those pictures. You don't save them forever and ever. Oh, remember those fireworks? No. They were great. We're awestruck by them to an extent, but after a while we delete them. Well, the angels didn't have and didn't need cell phones, but in a sense, they left behind 
these vivid images of creation and focused on the birth of a baby, the birth of Jesus. Here's what the song says. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Held incarnate, deity. Pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus, our Emmanuel. And the point, I believe it is, is this, that the greatest glory that God displayed was to come and to die for sinners, to come and live among them and to take their place. The greatest glory that God displayed was to come and die for sinners, for us to come and live among us and to take our place, the place that we deserved. And the angels must have thought, why would God do this? Why would God do this? And, you know, I'm using my imagination, but I'm, I'm, I'm firm biblical ground here when I say they must have been wondering, what's this about? What's going on? Because Peter tells us in 1 Peter 1.12, and, and he's speaking about the, uh, the prophets here. First of all, in 1 Peter 1.12, let's read that. It was revealed to them, the prophets, that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. And then he says, even angels look, or even angels long to look into these things. What does that mean? That means that the prophets were prophesying things that they didn't quite understand, and what they understood that was that it wasn't just for them, but it was for people in the future. And so they wondered about some of the things they prophesied. Even the angels the, the angels who saw God create the universe, just like uh, the prophets, they also uh, wondered. The angels who saw God create the universe, the angels who see God's face daily, they long to look more deeply into this wonder of the gospel. The prophets wondered about it because they didn't know about the gospel. They just prophesied what Jesus or what God spoke to them. And the angels wanted to look into they longed to look into these things they look they, they wanted to look more deeply into what was going on the wonder of the gospel and so they might have said why would God do this nevertheless he deserves the greatest praise for this and they gave it to him so the song says hail the heaven-born prince of peace hail the son of righteousness light and life to all he brings I love that. Light and life to all he brings. How many of you need light and uh, life in your life? He brings it to all. He offers it to all. And he says, risen with healing in his wings. The things that we need in our lives, light, life, healing. This is what he, he brings to us. And the angels saw this because the angels had seen God's power to create I read that astronomers say that there are three million trillion stars in our galaxy. Three million trillion stars. I mean, what does that even mean, right? I mean, it's, you know, I don't know. But they saw all of what God created, but they were more amazed at the mercy that Jesus showed to rebellious sinners and his power to heal them, his power to heal us. That's what they. Uh, what they sang about, that's what got their attention. Greater than the power that pours out from our Son is the power of God to put our lives back together after sin has messed them up. That's why they praised God in the highest. And the song continues, Mild He lays His glory by, born that man no more may die, born to raise the sons of earth, Oh, and I love this, born to give them second birth. Because the Bible says that, and this is a gospel, this is a gospel that you and I were doomed. We were doomed and Jesus came to save us. He came to save us. You see, underneath all your religious, good, moral makeup, you're just a rebellious sinner like I am. We all are. Now, that sounds kind of harsh, but look deep inside your heart. Deep inside your heart. Don't we, 
And haven't we assumed that we know what's best for our lives? We know better than God how to run our lives, what decisions to make. I mean, haven't we preferred to make ourselves a focus of our lives and the center of our lives rather than God? If we're honest with ourselves, I think we have to admit that's where we're tempted. And I know it's popular today to see ourselves as basically good people. Well, we have blind spots. Yeah, we have weaknesses or maybe we're just misunderstood. We have great potential, but that's not what the Bible says about us. It says that we're traitors to God and we're under the curse of death. And there are only two ways to resolve this. Just two ways. Either we suffer the curse of death ourselves eternally, which means that we're separated from God forever in a place called hell, or we place our trust in Jesus and in his sacrifice, not just that he came and was born, but that he died a death that we deserved. And by doing that, he took our sin. We put our trust in that and, and, and we, we trust him and surrender to him and allow him to change our lives. Because that was the cross. Jesus dying, absorbing our curse, dying in our place. The creator dying in, in the place of the created. And the angels can't understand this. They long to look deeply into this. Mild he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die. You know, and, and I know it's also popular to say that whatever you, however you want to follow God, that's okay. Right? God is like a mountain and all roads lead up to the top of the mountain. You're coming from different places, but they all get there. They all head to the same place. But again, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that there is... Uh, salvation is found rather in no one else. There's only one name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And that name is Jesus. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. Every religion teaches that you can save yourself. Just try harder. Pray harder. You know, just if you're good enough... Uh, Observe the religious observances, religious practices, you'll be saved. But Jesus said, no, you can't save yourselves. We can't save ourselves. So he saves us if we'll receive this. Religion says, try harder, be better. Jesus says, I did it for you. I did what you could never do. Just receive it as a gift. So there are not. There are not many ways to heaven. There's just one, and his name is Jesus. If, if I were, and, and this is an illustration I heard from, from somebody else. If I were uh, in the water and I couldn't swim, I'm drowning, and uh, somebody's standing you know, by the shore, you know, I can't swim to him because I can't swim, and so I'm yelling, save me, save me, and he's got, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 what do you call it, a life, not a life jacket, but uh, okay. So he has a he has a. Let me say it this way. He let's say he has a rock in one hand, right? Okay, he's got a floating circle. What's it called? <laughs> life preserver. Thank you. I just could not think of it. A life preserver. Okay, we're gonna cut that out of the video later. I don't want people to know that I forget. Okay, so, I, you know, you've got a life preserver and you've got a big old rock. And I say, save me, save me. And you say, what do you want? I said, it doesn't matter. Throw me one of the two. It doesn't matter. Well, of course, that's ridiculous. It, only one will save you, right? Only the life preserver will save you. A big rock, an anvil, whatever, is not going to save you. So it matters, you know, what we say and what we believe about how we are able to receive salvation. So... The message to us today from the shepherds is this. Hark. Listen. God has been pursuing you. Some of you right now might be feeling a tug in your heart like, man, I just need to draw close to God. I just need to surrender my life to God. I need change in my life. I've, I've, I've lived as if there is no God and I've made a mess of my life. God has been pursuing you. He's speaking to you. 
He's trying to wake you up. He's trying to draw you back to Himself. And I'm saying, would you stop and listen? Hark to what the angels are saying. Don't let the rush and distress of this uh, uh, Christmas season, that season that we're beginning, just overwhelm you. Stop and listen. Put aside all your objections and listen to what the angels are saying. They're not saying be better. They're not saying try harder. They're not saying, uh, you, you know, you can be good enough if you try hard enough. God is telling you, you'll never be good enough, but I love you. So much so that he sent his son to save you. So are you ready to hearken? Are you ready to listen to his voice today? That's what I want us to do. I want us to acknowledge and recognize that Jesus died for us. And in a few moments, we're going to take communion. And it'll be a, just a reminder that Jesus uh, commanded us to do, to practice, of what Jesus did. But right now, listen to his voice. Let this be a life-changing day, a life-changing time of year. Because maybe you, like the shepherds, are in that downward slide. Call out to God today. Listen to God's voice today. Would you bow for prayer? Father, we come before you, Lord, and we thank you for your word and for this beautiful song, Lord, that continues to, to, to just stir our hearts as long as we have been singing it many years. We've heard it. Lord, the truths behind it are just amazing and they're life-changing. And God, I, I believe that somebody who is here today or somebody who's watching, may find themselves, may consider themselves in that place like the shepherds with a dead-end job or situation. Maybe they have a good job, but they just don't have any hope. There's a desperation. There's a depression. God, I pray that they would be able to turn to you right now. If you're listening to this, before we continue praying, if you listen to this, and you're just ready to make a decision to follow Christ, something you've not done before, all you have to do is say, God, forgive my sins. All you have to do is, God, forgive me. Come into my life right now. I surrender to you. Come and save me. Come and give me purpose. Come and give me hope. Just receive his salvation right now, just wherever you are. Whether you're here or watching or listening online or on a podcast, just allow God to do that work in you. Father, I pray that those that are hurting would find their salvation and their release in you, Father. Grant it. We turn to you right now in Jesus' name.